Welcome to Brandstorm, the podcast that talks to the people behind America's brands. I'm Dan Trzinski, president of Platypus Advertising and Design. And I'm Nancy Christopher, PR director at Platypus. Like many traditional media outlets since the coming of the digital age, radio is grappling with its relevancy and what to do about its future. Our guest, Kipper McGee, is here to talk about why radio stations need to embrace what he calls their brand with which, by the way, is also the name of his book. Welcome to Brandstorm, Kipper. Hey, thank you very much. Hi. Kipper McGee, great radio name. Were you a DJ once? Well, I think the statute of limitations has <laughs> run out, so I can admit, yes, I was. In fact, I did mornings in this very market, Milwaukee, with a partner named Julie. So it was Kipper McGee and Julie, Julie for those of a certain demo. And I'm sure there were lots of promos that went around that. Oh, and the prizes came out of the closet. So <laughs> yeah. the, the famous prize closet. Uh-huh. Well, and in full disclosure, Kipper and I worked together 35-ish years ago. <laughs> <laughs> at, really? at, at yes. WKTI. Yeah, yeah. Back, oh. so back we, in the we, days of silent radio. Yeah. <laughs> or, or as we called it, dead air. Yeah, right. Yeah. But we were really at the foundation of taking a radio station that was uh, an automated radio station that was basically the uh, 80s version of Spotify or anything else where it just played music and there was no personality to it. It just was the FM version of digital streaming radio today because there was... No announcers, no thing, and took it live and built that from kind of zero to the number one station in the market with the help of a lot of, what a really talented group of people we had at that one time, crew. right? Yeah, well, and yeah. I still hear people say, boy, I sure miss WKDI. Now it's country. But but in the early 80s, that was the, the height of kind of the pop music renaissance, and it was fun. It was. Well, I understand, though, you have worn just about every hat in radio there is. So tell us a little bit about yourself, Kipper. Well, yes, I was always kind of a radio fan. Grew up listening to stations like WOKY and, and certainly WTMJ, the sister of KTI. But I also listened to Chicago radio a lot, and one of my stations was WLS. So as I went through the ranks, and I started as on air, got my first programming job, and realized that I could get much better people to be on the air. Right. <laughs> Plus, I, I, I like the programming. So I worked into that, ended up general managing a station in, in Des Moines, a combo, which became a six-station cluster. And then... Long story short is after the radio nomadic trail, Orlando, St. Louis, you, know, you, you name it, um, New Orleans, uh, we ended up back in Chicago at WLS. So I got to run that station for five years. That was awesome. Yeah, yeah that, full circle for you. Yeah, your it boyhood was. listening. And that's obviously an iconic brand in yeah. radio. Um, I remember listening to it when I was a kid. Even I was in northern Wisconsin, it's such a powerful signal yes. that at night you could listen to... Who was the big DJ? Oh, gosh. There. Larry L- Lujan. Larry, Larry Lujan. John Records Landecker. You yeah. know, I mean, and John all of these. still, I just yeah. actually connected with him last week. But yeah, he, he's doing great. His daughter is, by the way, in Netflix's Transparent. She's Emmy Award winning. And, wow. Yeah. She, so John gets to go to all the Grammys and all the, if there's a gold statue in Hollywood, John has been there. Oh, that's exciting. So it's very cool. Yeah, it yeah. is. Well, you know, in your book, you say that the radio industry, or broadcasting in general, is missing what you call the media morphosis. Mm-hmm. What do you mean by that? Media morphosis is basically just a way of saying evolution. You know, that media should be going through a metamorphosis. But in many ways, media is, but broadcast is not. And so that's one of the things that is missing. And in fact, this book was written a couple of years ago, but they're doing a second printing next week because the message is still, you know, bang on that people are really missing that, you know, if it's a 360 degree playing field, they're missing about 190% of it. Wow. You know, because they're just using one arm broadcasting and and there's so much other stuff they could be doing to fortify their brand. Well, explain what you mean by that. What else could they be doing? I mean, what are some of these other avenues they should be going besides broadcasting? Because that's what they know how to do. It is. And the thing is that if the skill sets are applied to other options, you know, I talk about brand management, not just radio. 
You know, the same right, way right, that, right. that you guys talk about consumers, not just listeners or viewers right. or Correct. whatever your agency is serving. The thing is, many radio people, either because of comfort or because of inertia or just fear of change, you know, don't want to be thinking that, oh, gosh, social media could help people find something on the radio. And, heck, we could do a podcast, you know, and, and let this guest go on for a half hour if they want to with a video because now, I mean, there are basically three options, audio, video, or text. That's sure, it. Sure, And so the thing is that now everyone has access to all of those, but very few want to use more than one or two. Yeah, I'm shocked that podcasting, we're sitting here doing a podcast as we speak, but mm-hmm. podcasting has just trickling into that whole radio industry. It's like, God, they should have been at the the leadership of this drive, you know, and it's obviously podcasting's listening is up 400% in the last three years. Exactly. And people want to consume media that way. And they seem to be following the trend versus leading the trend. Well, yes. And, and also symptomatic is that using the radio mentality, their idea of podcasting is basically a glorified DVR. They just take Correct. a show and put sure. it on and listen right. to it later. And uh-uh. those that are smart... Are, are the ones that are doing something unique and different and preferably short. You know, I mean, people don't need a three-hour podcast. No. No one has time for that. No. You know, and I find it interesting too, Kipper, is that Facebook, social media, all that stuff, they are taking advantage of different platforms to promote themselves, and that's why they become so huge. Yes. Especially the, the news lately. <laughs> but, uh, right, right, right. Yeah, but they are. <laughs> that we'll talk about on another day. <laughs> yes. But, um, no, you're absolutely right, is that online marketing, I've noticed, they're very savvy in certain things like lead generation, capturing data base building relationship online with people, mm-hmm. but they are reluctant to use the old media because they think it's old school and passe, and they're kind of missing the point. Well, about 95% of all people are still listening to radio at least once a week. They may not be spending as much time with it for the reasons you mentioned, Spotify, Pandora. Yeah, it's and, it's fragmented now compared yeah. to, and you know, I'm a huge satellite radio listener. It seems sacrilegious based on my roots and where I came from. But I mean, there's just, you know, so many choices and I do a lot of traveling on the road. I don't have to change Change stations. I'm a satellite listener too for three months because I just got my new car Uh and uh, I had that free trial. (laughs) One of the things you learn is they made a very smart shift about two years ago in January. They started promoting everything or listen on the Sirius XM app. app. Right, on your smartphone. Because they realized that you know, they couldn't play inside the house. Right. Because you can't get it. But but I connected my XM account now to my Alexa, and I can You're just done. say, Alexa, play Willie's Roadhouse, you know, and uh, listen to loft, Old Time yeah, Country absolutely. or whatever it mm-hmm. happens to be, and bam, it's on in my house. So that's, again, another challenge to the traditional terrestrial radio. Although uh, that, too, is proving to be a silver arrow in the quiver, because smart radio is learning to use the Alexa skills to be listened to in-house in an era where about 35% of homes no longer have a radio anymore. Well, now we have the transistor via the phone and with Alexa and other home devices, they're back in. So what does this all mean for radio? You mentioned in your book that you feel like radio is a step behind television. We've talked about on this show cord cutting Mm -hmm. and how television stations are adapting. Uh, But you say radio is a step behind. What do you mean by that? Well, Change is evolution, and part of that media morphosis we talked about is that we have to realize as content producers, we are no longer in the import business. We used to think we put something on the air, create a radio station, TV show, and then import people at 6.30 to watch it. Now it's export. We create the show, and then people come and get it when they want to. Right. So that's a different mindset. And as people are thinking about putting apples on the shelves so the shopper can buy them when they're in the store, that's different than saying, I'm I'm selling apples for 10 minutes. The old Kmart blue light special for the next five minutes we'll be doing. Well, it only talks to the people in the store who might want, you know, new bowling socks or whatever it was. It is kind of a dramatic mind shift. And what's happening is that those that can utilize all of the bandwidth to promote, market, and distribute their brands, 
they're mastering brand width, and that's what the sure. name of the game is. So give me an example of how you do that. Let's say television news, for example, says a fire on 15th Street, mm-hmm. film at 11. Mm-hmm. How would you adjust that in the new age of demand? Well, first of all, facts are not as valuable as they once were. It used to be you would go to TV or newspaper or whatever for facts. Well, now we're constantly getting barraged with facts on our phones, phones or whatever. right. All the time. So it becomes really what's in it for me and not so much recent history, what has happened, because people either know that or they can You can watch it it live and a a million different, you know, film at 11 is irrelevant uh, because it's like you can go to Facebook Live right now and watch the fire, you know, because there's somebody with a smartphone, whether it's, you know, the news media person or just a neighbor of the fire is broadcasting. (laughs) Yes. What I talk with my clients about is the with them, what's in it for me, and then add N now. So what's in it for me now? What's in it for me next? So learning that there was an election last night, no, but what do the people who got elected plan to do? What are they going to do? What's going to happen? What's it mean for traffic? Is there an inauguration somewhere that's going to tie up downtown for an hour? Sure. You know, that kind of stuff. What's in it for me? How does it impact my life? And then, you know, what's the, what's the end result of that? And in news especially, it's got to be forward thinking. You got to keep advancing the story, regurgitating old stuff as we're seeing right now. And, and the irony I'm noticing even on the network broadcast uh, stations right now is that it used to be that mornings were kind of a regurgitation of evening news. Correct. It's flipped. It's flipped. Yep. TV has become morning radio for many people, uh, especially at, at home before they leave. Right. And you know, radio is, or TV is adopted with short segments and frequent weather and you know time checks and all that kind of stuff. And what's happened is that TV is replaying that at five, six, ten. Right. You know, and then sometimes even the next morning the same package is still sure. running. And that to me is symptomatic of just plain budget cuts and lack of staff and lack of people that can cover it. Because believe me, we know this, folks. They know better. Sure. So in your book, you say traditional radio advertising. This was really curious to me. Radio advertising needs to change as well. Mm -hmm. In what way? Well, for one thing, once we are all listening on Alexa as opposed to a radio station, there is no need for the three of us to hear the same commercial at the same time. Why can't media become like Amazon and Google and say, here's some things recommended? I will bet if we each pull up our Amazon recommendations right now, they're totally different. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, based on what they are. And by the way, if you want to have some fun with Google, just type in a bunch of random stuff in your search. You know, and then watch what kind of ads appear up. Right, this right. And, you know, <laughs> boy, and, and you, can, you can really baffle it for a while, but it'll settle down after a while if you stop doing that. But the reality is, you know, number one, targeting the message to the consumer who's likely to want it. Because as an advertiser, would you rather have 30,000 people hear it or 6,000 prospects? Right. And the other thing is they can be shorter because you don't need to tell the whole story because radio is one of the few mediums that still does 60-second linear one-dimensional message audio, 60 right. seconds. Right. TV, meanwhile, as you guys know, is going to you know not only 30s but 15s and 10s and 5s. Five. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. So the point being, why can't a radio just say, need tires? Press the tire icon. Well, exactly. And we know oh, yeah. from our visit with Nielsen – we have the technology. Oh, they do to do this. Yeah, it's. I mean, there's still some privacy issues and things. You know, like Facebook is going it's through that yeah. need to be resolved. But the reality is, if you sign up to be a serious XM subscriber, you sign up for an app, you sign up for whatever, you're giving up your data. You're inviting some sort of dialogue. Right. So, how do terrestrial radio stations though gather that data about you? How do they know? Is it through the? It, you have to be listening through the app. In order to get it on Alexa, does the radio station collect information so they know that they could serve me a specific thing that I'm interested in? They will once you are listening online with an account. When you are using like a Google Play or or Siri or Alexa or any of those, right now it's a leap of faith that Amazon is going to tell you that. 
Right. And that is all still to be worked out. So I mean, right. it's, it's still like, the way I started this back in Des Moines, and this was before internet, we did it good old fashioned mail. Okay. <laughs> and we call Which it, can be highly effective right now, I think. <laughs> it can be. It's less clutter in the mailbox than exactly. it is in my email inbox. Trust me. Absolutely. But what we did is we actually created a um, package that looked just like Valpac. Mm-hmm. And we sold Valpac size coupons with a schedule. And we called it our VIP listener club or whatever it was. Sure. But it was invited mail. Our coupons were getting like 25, 27% return where the average Val Pack was like 1.52 because ours was invited. We were a known quantity. We were their friend. Sure. And we also were giving them stuff of value because along with the coupons came a newsletter with some special content. All the things that apply to, to the online thing we're talking about now, but we also use that as our primary contesting device. Sure. Because a lot of radio stations complain that they've got the same people winning over and over. In fact, uh, some unenlightened stations call those prize pigs. Right. Funny, American Airlines <laughs> calls listener. them frequent, frequent flyers. <laughs> right, <you know>? right. <laughs> Loyal, <laughs> listeners, Loyal listeners, you know, right. Yeah. But by using the database, you can kind of control, you know, where you're drawing from and make sure, you know, number one, you won't get the same name twice. Number two is... You know, just throw it on balance, make sure your geography is is there. There's so many things you can do, and it builds the database. And in that station in Des Moines, we had half the cum mathematically in the database. And right now, I think even a major market station would say if they had 2,000, they're doing pretty good. No, they should be doing, you know, three, 400,000. Broadcasters have a great many of platforms to promote their brand, right. you know, a of social media, Facebook, their website, apps, all mm-hmm. those types of things. But many of them still don't or do a bad job of it. Why do you think that is? I think really it boils down to two things, budget and the bandwidth of the humans that are doing six or seven jobs where you and I used to do right. one. Right, right. I mean, we, we would help each other out sure. and do things we could. You know, you'd hang a banner, I'd help run something down to traffic Right, or but you like might that. have one social media a la intern that's running a cluster of six stations, Facebook pages. Yeah, or some today. companies are just saying to like the air talent, okay, not only are you not working full time anymore, we're going to pay you 40 minutes a day to record your show and we'll play it back over five hours. But also we want three social media posts, one blog post and, you know, all this other stuff every day. I think there's an opportunity here. Millennials are really all about collaborating, Mm -hmm. collaboration. That can happen more, I think, at stations to help some of those problems if they start collaborating together to figure out how they're going to push their product out. That might be a good idea. And one demographic thing we're noticing now is that millennial folks tend to like things that are free. That's a good price point for them. Radio well, I is think that's free. A good that's price a good price point for, for everybody. Or baby boomer too. <laughs> yeah, but, but radio is free. Sure. I mean, obviously, whenever something is free, the commodity being sold is us. Right. <laughs> right. But whether it's through advertising or like yeah. Mr. Zuckerberg, we're, we're all finding data. that out on Facebook uh-huh. right now. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but the reality is that um, they like free, but they also like curation. So, like, you turn on Pandora, and one of the things that they have not figured out yet is that you punch in a song, you don't want to hear that same song five minutes later by another artist. And especially that is painful during the holiday season. Sure. Because you put in a Christmas song. There's really only like 28 Christmas songs, and everybody does a a different style to it. But even the Christmas music radio stations has somebody saying, okay, well, let's not play Bing Crosby White Christmas next to, you know, uh, Martina McBride or whatever it is. Sure. So curation is a big thing. And the other thing is that if radio were smart, there is nothing that Pandora or Spotify can do that they can't do as well by just having a separate stream. Sure. And in fact... I Excellent know, idea. I know of one station that's really doing that. They're, they're basically doing their radio station on their mainstream, but they have a second stream that is just the same music without all the interruption. And the spot breaks are like Pandora, you know, five seconds, 10 seconds, 15. Sure. And limited, you know, maybe twice an hour they do one, you know. 
as marketers who use radio still very effectively, just traditional mm-hmm. radio stations, what can we do to nudge stations to embrace the new media and their offerings and help us take advantage of all those technologies? Because we don't see it as an ad agency coming from them. Yeah, and the scary thing is that leaders often don't change, not because change is not apparent and the direction is clear, but because it's uncomfortable for them to do it. We have always slash never done it X way. So that's the first thing is getting over that fear of change. And number two is really just saying, Look at what's happening here. I mean, there are studies galore. The Edison Infinite Dial study, you know, Jacobs Media does one. Nielsen's doing them. Sure. Know. It's just a question of saying, okay, we're going to take a leadership role rather than stick our head in the sand and pretend it's not happening. Yeah, because I think now, oftentimes, it's agencies like ourselves that are actually challenging the media station to give us something more, tell us how you might be able to accomplish what we're trying to do here. I'm going to rewind back to like five years ago when we were talking to radio stations, television stations about, at that time, emerging media, which isn't emerging anymore, it's here. We created our own monster by saying, well, we want that as value added. We don't want to pay for it. We don't want to, and they didn't know how to monetize it. And they all had a Facebook page. And we got to this point where they didn't value it because they couldn't, get a spend towards it, and now they're trying to do it and playing catch-up. Yeah. And you don't want to pay for it. And, and, you st- and, and advertisers still don't want to pay for it because they haven't connected all the dots to say, okay, you know, look, we can tie this right back into ROI. Because mm-hmm. uh, when you're doing it on your own, you can do that. You know, We can right. put Google ads out there and send them to a specific landing page that then comes back to a specific phone number and then track everything all the way back to saying, here was the spend, here's the keyword they searched, and here's how many, what percentage of the people that clicked. And then of that percentage, how many people actually bought the product. That doesn't happen in the media, in the traditional media world yet. Yes. And again, I think it's because people are just stretched so thin. You know, a guy who's managing one station is now doing six, you know, or, or doing six in this market and six in Madison, six in, you know, somewhere else. But do you think sooner or later the light bulb's got to come on and say, man, we, we are missing it huge has revenue to. opportunity? Yeah. And right. That maybe we should hire some more people to start taking advantage of these revenue streams that are out there. Exactly. Uh, and part of that, too, is a challenge that it is. it does require a different skill set for the creative. You need people that can do design, sure. that can make something look decent, you know, that can edit a piece of video or audio. And the thing is, you're right. You just hire your, your grandkids, you know, and, yeah. <laughs> and you're set, you know. Because I think at the end of the day, they still have the 800-pound gorilla. They reach massive amounts of people. Right. You know, even though it's still it's fragmented and stuff like that. But on a daily basis, like you said, 100% of the population still tunes into a terrestrial radio station at least a couple times a week. Yeah, you and know? same I mean, with TV, you know. Sure. But just they don't need it anymore. They have the reach. Yeah. You know, it's and they have the ability to drive that reach into these – narrow casting areas where then you could do that measurement. Well, Um, and you're right. Once you've got that free genie out of the bottle, it's hard to say, oh, by the way, now it's cost. Right. That that was a very flawed tactic back in the day. However, one of the things that I think people can do is start bundling stuff so they bring them a whole package for this price and don't break it down to per spot. But just that, it'll re- you, know, you still give metrics, it'll reach this, it'll do that. But, by the way, would you mind if we did something where you could actually collect names of people who are interested? You wouldn't. Well, right. funny you should ask. We've got a way to do that. In fact, what we'll do is on our radio commercials, we will use a text number, and the text response simply asks for one thing, email. Sure. And then it begins. What survival tips do you recommend for radio stations at this point? Wake up and smell the future. (laughs) That's a good one. I'm going to add to that because I said it earlier and and I do think it's a good idea. If all these media properties are downsizing, then maybe they need to collaborate elsewhere too to be able to deliver what consumers want because consumers are kind of in charge now. That's exactly right. And to a point raised earlier, I mean, probably the biggest shift is the fact that we used to go from producer control, you know, tune in tonight at 11, you know. Right. It, now it's 
it's totally consumer it's control. It's an on-demand society now. When I mean, they want, we want to, to, right. And I think one of the key things is if we were creating radio today, we'd look at a couple of things differently. Number one, is our entire platform technologically in sync with culture? Or are we trying to hold on to a butter churn? Yep. You know, rather than you know, realizing right. people are going to the store. Uh, number two is you want to make sure you are creatively in sync, and that means creating content for the various platforms. A uh, tweet is going to be written differently than a liner card would be for a radio station. You know, it has to be. And also should deliver something, be it a link or, or image or something that you know, adds value. So to your point, you know, sure. value added is something that radio kind of really abused that probably back in the 80s is when that really started. But it used to be, you know, Henry Ford, value added is taking $200 of sheet metal, turning it into an $800 car. Right. That was adding value. Radio says, and TV well, what can we give them for free? That will be value added. No, value added is customer service, creative. You know, it's all the sure. other things, but we ignore that. You know, so again, it's a matter of vision, framing, and the management uh, viewpoint. It boils down to this: there's only one really substantial survival tactic that is going to be sustainable, and that is innovation. And as long no as question. people are so busy running on the the treadmill, they're not going to have time to be thinking about, well, how can we do this better, bigger, you know, brighter, add ER to stuff, and, and that gets lost. And it's just shuffle. seeing what's next. And this t takes our whole conversation full circle to where we started. You know, we took an automated radio station that didn't have any personality, didn't really have any disc jockeys, didn't have any, you know, I mean, it was just like kind of canned weather that just, you know, every now and then it would it would drip in there. And it was basically Spotify of today. Yes. And this is 1980, mm -hmm. uh, in 1981, and then took it to say, well, look, we have to be what's next. We have to add the personalities that AM radio station, now this is, you know, FM, right. you know, which is just, remember it was free music, right? That's what FM stood for. It was just music all the time. But add personality, add talk. I mean, you know, putting Reitman and Miller together and having a show that played very little music in the morning was add, foreign to everybody. Add value. But it was what was next. Exactly. And at that time, but it was only in their own little world. You know, now I think that where they've dropped the ball is saying, okay, how do we embrace all of this other stuff? Whether it's Twitter and Facebook and they apps. need think days, Dan. Yeah, they need to step away from that yeah. busy day by day operating schedule and say, okay, today we're just going to take some time and think. Right. How can we be innovative? And that is great. And the companies I've worked for that have done that have been very successful. The challenge of those today is again when you're running three markets with the same staff. Sure. You know, and yeah, and they're thinking, you look at like what iHeart, okay, I don't want to pick on them. They're good partners of ours or something mm -hmm. like that. But, you know, they've got a great app and, you know, they're listed up there. But they're taking kind of a, a non-local view of that app. It's like, okay, what can we do where we can do it once and roll it out for the whole country and that just, right. you know, that's a one size fits all. But what does that really do for the Milwaukee listener or the Des Moines listener or the... Individual, Nothing, anywhere. Or individual, yeah. anywhere. Yeah, and and one of the challenges too is that, you know, as we go from Uber customization, which is what we were trying to do with local radio, and right. and that, now we have technology to do micro customization, right. but instead we're doing one size fits all, or as some say, one size fits Al, and if he's not your size, right? <laughs> that's it. That's it. <laughs> you had a great light in your book, if the. Broadcast industry dies. Mm -hmm. It'll be ruled a suicide. Yes. So you really think they are in charge of their own destiny? Oh, totally. I think we all are, aren't we? Sure. I mean, you know, if I stop working with stations and clients, you know, I won't be making a living. If you guys shut down your doors or if you start phoning it in, if you just came in, you know, twice a week and just returned a couple calls – you're not going to be doing what you're doing now with all the thriving things that are going on because you're going out and finding stuff. You're making it happen. So I can't do that? Sorry, Dan. Oh. Well, you could. <laughs> yeah. But if you do... It's a new destiny. I guess i got to change my plan. <laughs> It'll be ruled self-inflicted. Sure. Least. 
We'll put it that way. Absolutely. So if any of our listeners are interested in connecting with you, Kipper, what's the best way to, to reach you? You know, really, um, email is fine, kipper at kippermcgee.com. Also, um, we have a podcast called Brand With On Demand, which is more media. It's right, right. kind of a compliment to yours, but mostly for media folks. Yeah. And um, also on any social platform, it's just at Kipper McGee. Yeah. And you're a, yeah, you're a big LinkedIn guy. I know I've, I see your post, your little every morning, what do you call it again? Morning it's blend. Morning, morning blend. Yeah. yeah you, you, you put a, a nice little thought for the day out there every day. I yeah. enjoy seeing those. Well, thank you. So. Well, I know you are focused really on broadcasting, but I think a lot of the lessons in your book, Brand With, apply really to any company. And I want to congratulate you on your second printing. Thank you. I think Brand With, it's, it's a good, fast read, and it's filled with solid advice for anyone interested in really learning about how you can make radio relevant again. Best of luck to you, Kipper. Thanks for coming in today. My pleasure. Thank you. It's always good to see you. If you like what you've heard today, please don't forget to share, review, and subscribe to Brandstorm. And if you have a home device and need to know how to play our show, just simply refer to our show notes. This is Dan Trzinski along with Nancy Christopher at Platypus Advertising and Design, an awesome company that creates perceptions that influence choice for a variety of regional, national, and even global brands on a daily basis. We hope you'll join us next week for another episode of Brandstorm. Brandstorm.